And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrennerCast. Yes, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hi everyone and welcome to PrennerCast. Dom here, Pete's usual partner in crime, and I'm really excited to share something special for this week's edition of the show. It's an over-the-shoulder conversation between Pete and multiple New York Times best-selling author, angel investor, and all-round superstar, Tim Ferriss. Tim's newest book, The 4-Hour Chef, comes out this week through Amazon's new publishing arm, and given that it's being published by the Amazon machine, a lot of the typical bricks-and-mortar bookstores, such as Barnes & Noble, are not stocking the book on their shelves. Tim and Pete talk about how to deal with the situation. Plus, you'll hear a little of Tim's background that hasn't really been discussed before. They also talk about how Tim sees direct response marketing fitting into his brand. And obviously, they talk a lot about The 4-Hour Chef, which, if you haven't heard much about the book yet, possibly isn't what you'd expect given the title. So, sit back and enjoy this fly-on-the-wall style access to the best bits of a recent conversation Tim and Pete had just for our show. So, Tim, thanks for your time, mate. Really appreciate it. Are you kidding? Anything for someone in Melbourne. I love that. (laughs) Awesome, dude. Awesome. So, look, you know, you've spoken a whole lot about the path you took for the four-hour work week to sort of do what it did. So, you know, I don't want to flog that dead horse or anything like that but the, the two subsequent books you've done you know, obviously the four hour body and the four hour chef which is insanely big i, yeah. I want to ask you a take on what's changed with the marketing or even just the positioning of taking those books to market because i guess the, the question i have for you is what percentage do you think of the book's success comes down to good marketing versus good content and the books clearly got good content because they're huge so what, what do you reckon is a breakdown from that perspective yeah, so I'll I'll jump right into uh, a couple of recommendations for folks. Uh, I think the the best materials I've ever read on marketing are uh, very short, in fact. So one is One Thousand True Fans by That's Kevin Kelly. Yep. Yeah, founding editor of Wired Magazine. Another is actually new. Uh, I think it's called uh, The Truth About Social Media or something very generic sounding, but it's by Tim O'Reilly, who is a yep. very smart technologist. Uh, and then lastly, the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Right, and, yep. and the reason I lead off with those three is that I view marketing and sales as very different. Uh, and marketing, I view as very specifically targeting who you are creating a product for. And from the very first day, day one, ground zero, you're creating a product with those 1,000 true fans in mind. And the way that I've written my books, especially The 4-Hour Body and The 4-Hour Chef, is so that each section of the book or each chapter of the book can have and, and ideally will have 1,000 diehard true fans, each in a different vertical. Yeah. So what I, what I would actually say is that although perhaps the most public uh, facing portion of me is viewed as, as a marketer and I'm very flattered to be looked upon as a competent marketer, I would say that the marketing begins when I f- put the first word down of research for that book. Yep. And that, in fact, the the content is the marketing. Now, you also have to be very good at PR and ultimately sales, i.e. convincing, let's say, booksellers or even a publisher to print a certain number of copies, etc., mm. and forging business develop relationships. So, for instance, any type of co-promotion would be in my mind, under the business development umbrella. But at its heart, uh, I, I think that marketing is, is, uh, uh, is started and finished to a large extent with the content. And the reason I say that is, uh, as uh, an author, for instance, on the advice how to list for the New York Times, I know many, many, many CEOs who have their books ghostwritten and then spend about a quarter million of dollars yep. uh, to put their book on the New York Times for one week. So it's possible to game the list yeah. quite easily for one or two weeks. Uh, in my case, it'll actually be, it would be tough if I tried it because uh, I'm being boycotted by a, a lot of the retailers since I'm with uh, Amazon Publishing and their first major book. Which but is very interesting. Just fascinating. But putting all that aside, the, 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 the four-hour work week, for instance, was on the New York Times list for four and a half years unbroken. And I only pushed it for the first 
four to eight weeks, really. Uh, the four hour body actually came out of the gate and was selling four to five times the rate of the four hour work week. So it's go actually going to pass uh, the, you know, the one million book mark uh, on a much shorter time frame than the four hour work week. And so they're actually about neck and neck. Like if you look at Amazon, they go back and forth. And I think that the way you create that longevity is by first and foremost, a focus on content. Yeah. I completely agree. I think that the longevity and, and the stick comes from great content, but at some point there's got to be that tipping point where you know there's plenty of people out there who are so talented, whether they're photographers or even athletes, and they just haven't got to that point where that their longevity and their actual, I guess you call it their brand or their awareness is what drives it. It's, just, it's yeah. always interesting to see that what is that the tipping point because obviously from the outside you could easily say that one of the reasons that the four-hour body's done so well is because of all the history that the four-hour work week created. And they, they, had, they already had that exposure. So the book, you know, not that I'm saying it's, it's bad because it's, it's fantastic and, you know, my wife loves it and I love it, that it's an amazing book and it, and it sticks because of that. But it had that quick acceleration because of the, the brand and the history and the exposure you'd already built yourself off the back of the blog and obviously the first book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a momentum that aids it, yeah. but there are also... Many, many examples of, uh, for instance, you know, the sophomore album, right? <laughs> yep. And, Huge sales they, first week and then drop. Yeah, and they, and they face plant. And so yep. there are many examples of books that do not live up to the quality expectations of the readers who enjoy the first book, for instance. And, uh, you know, part of the reason writing books gets difficult with each book that I write is that I try to top the one that came before it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's certainly true with this one, you know, 1,500 photographs, illustrations, Calvin and Hobbes cartoons, supermodels. It's got, you know, it's got everything in there. It's very cool. I've, I've had a good flick through. It's been, it's been a, a fantastic read. But um, you, you kind of mentioned before that people acknowledge you as a, a great marketer. But I actually think from the conversations I have is that a lot of people see you as a great content marketer, not a, I guess, a traditional direct response marketer. Yeah. And I'd say that I've, you know, I know you've spoken before about sort of, you know, Hopkins and Sugarman and, and even Dan Kennedy to a certain extent um, as sort of been, uh, I guess, some sort of examples for you to learn by and read from. And Dan actually spoke about you in his latest newsletter this month, which was kind of cool. Oh, no um, kidding. Yeah, it was actually about Ryan Holiday as well, who's a, who's a good friend of both of ours. Um, gave Ryan a recommendation, actually, they mentioned you in the same, um, same couple of pages, which is which very ironic and cool because I was speaking to you both of you this week. But um, the one thing I want to ask you, though, is that what, because I guess most people sort of see you from the blog and the content marketing stuff. Where does it actually fit for you for direct response marketing? How have you kind of been able to actually apply those principles without sort of coming off as a sleazy direct response marketer? <laughs> no, that's a good question. So I actually think direct response is everything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've done a brilliant job of sort of, I guess you know, having that bridge a little bit different, all that separation from the traditional direct response guys. Yeah, I, I suppose so. I mean, the I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, good teaching, good writing, uh, certainly from nonfiction sort of advice, how to is getting people to take action. If you want your books to have any lasting value for your readers. And what is getting people to take action? You need either a direct or indirect call to action. So I've studied the, uh, the, the legends of direct uh, marketing, direct response from day one. I mean, I've looked at, uh, you know, Ogilvy, who spanned kind of both worlds, both yeah. brand and direct response. Sugarman, of course, how could you not? Uh, Kennedy, uh, you know, Claude Hopkins. And the, the importance of that cannot be underestimated because the way I look at it, and this is actually said to me by a gentleman from Microsoft, is that thinking is asking and answering questions. And that is reflected in language. So if you control language in the written form, you are able to control thought, right? And that is a very mm. peculiar, peculiar notion. Now, then taking that a step further, the question is, you know, how do I convince people to take specific actions, which as a teacher, first and foremost, and that's how I view myself, that's my objective. If, if someone reads the book and puts it down, I view that as a failure. So when you look at my books, if you really dissect and analyze, whether it's the four-hour chef, the four-hour body, even the four-hour work week to a lesser extent, because I'd like to think I've gotten better at this over time, you find very short, self-contained magazine articles, beginning, middle, and end, with specific calls to action at specific points, the formatting of the text itself is even broken up so that there's a, there's a, national, a natural momentum mm. uh, that allows people to continue and have a sense of closure every few pages. 
it is from start to finish designed to get people to take specific actions that I think will benefit them. And I think that's why you can look at many diet books, and certainly I do not have a long history of diet or fitness books, but I get people to actually implement. And I think that's uh, one that's something I'm very proud of. I mean, I can point to people, I can point to thousands of people who have lost, you know, 20 to 150 pounds easily, and they never had a personal trainer. All they did was follow very basic advice uh, that I was able to get them to implement and stick to. Now, uh, the reason that I think I don't typically get grouped into uh, the category of you know, sleazy direct marketer, and I think that there are many different types of direct marketers, uh, certainly even at the highest levels. If you look at any type of advertisement on television, magazines, or otherwise that has a phone number or a website. <laughs> that's direct response. That's direct response. Yeah. But I, I don't get put into the group of like fly-by-night uh, con artists, although certainly, I mean, some people would view me as, as that, but that's going to happen whenever you get enough exposure, uh, is because I don't follow the usual routine of, let's say, long sales copy, yellow highlights, <laughs> but that's all PS, PPS. Yeah. PPPS, I don't do that and I avoid it very deliberately because number one, it uh, for the 1,000 true fans that I want, I know them well enough that I know that will decrease my conversion and hurt my credibility so I will not get them to do what? To get them to take action and ultimately all about the CTA and the conversion, right? Yeah, that's what it all comes down to. And so when I'm working with startups, let's just say whether it's, uh, you know, I work with, I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of very, very uh, world-class startups, and I've done that since 2007. So whether it's, you know, Uber, Evernote, Shopify, StumbleUpon, whatever, the first place that I focus is messaging, call to action, and copy, because that is where <laughs> you live or die, you know, merely survive or thrive is in the copy, because it is crystallized thought. And that is a conversation with every single person who sees it. Um, so yes, I have very strong opinions about it. But I think that my early studying of copywriting and direct response, which I, I want to mention is predicated on being a good writer. Mm. You cannot, I don't think it is possible to be a good direct response marketer, a good advertiser, without being extremely good at communicating in the written word, which means you should be able to put together a damn good 3,000-word magazine article. And if you can't, you should develop that skill because it will do nothing but assist your, your business. Yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. So bird by yeah. bird type books and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bird by bird, uh, simple and direct is a great book on sort of rhetoric and negotiation and writing. Uh, on Writing Well by Zinsner yeah. is, is a fantastic book. Uh, those, those are coming to a few of the top uh, picks, I would say, in addition to that, uh, letters, letters uh, to a fiction writer, which is actually a collection of letters from accomplished fiction writers to novices or beginners. Uh, cool. Address the creative process in, in very short letters is outstanding. I would say Stephen King's book on writing, yep. also absolutely wonderful. And when I think that many people have an aversion to this because they're like, well, I'm not a writer. I don't want to study that stuff because I'm not a writer. I'm like, that's not the point. What you should realize is that Writing is thought that you can analyze. <laughs> yep. Like writing is thinking that you can improve and actually edit. And uh, one example that I like to bring up is when I studied nonfiction writing, I was very lucky to study a nonfiction writing under John McPhee when I was at Princeton for one, one semester. And he had a class called The Literature of Fact. John McPhee is a staff writer for The New Yorker, has been for decades, and is also a Pulitzer Prize winner. And uh, I remember getting our first writing assignment back and there was more red ink, his red ink, <laughs> initial black ink that I typed with. He <laughs> viscerated my writing and it, uh, over time the red ink became less and less because I tightened my writing, made it clearer, eliminated all this flowery bullshit that I was putting in there. And the, the really fascinating part of it was that my grades in every other class went up because why? My thinking was clearer. Yep. Communication, yeah. getting to the point. Yeah. Anyway, so I get real passionate about this, but I think that if you're a student of direct response, you're a student of good communication, and the, the fastest, most direct way to improve your thinking and communication is through writing. Yeah. No, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So in, in terms of that, when you were sort of starting out, obviously, in the, the whole you know, thousand true fans kind of stuff was bubbling and you know, the first book was coming out and things like that. 
being a, a student of direct response, was your initial plans to kind of go down the path of being, quote unquote, an online information marketer and maybe at the end of the day, at the back of the book, it might sell a few thousand copies and you can sort of get a thousand true fans and sell them home study courses and, and workshops and stuff. And then you suddenly, on a dime with the success of the book, go down the more, again, quote unquote, credible path by not doing that sort of back end upsell kind of scenario? Was it always sort of planned to sort of roll the dice and, and, and hope that it worked out the way it has? Yeah, you know, I, it's, <laughs> it seems odd for me to say this because I've always been fascinated by direct response. And I mean, I would order stuff from infomercials just to see <laughs> where it got shipped from, what it came with, what the upsells were, what the cross sells were, uh, how they would follow up. You know, I was just fascinated by all that. Um, but when I wrote the 4-Hour Work Week, I did not have any plans to have an entire back-end upsell program, coaching, etc. I really didn't. And, uh, you know, I, I looked at it every once in a while because people would pitch me on it and I'd get yeah. emails and so forth. But I, I think really what I was aiming to do was... So if I took that route, the ultimate object objective, or one of the objectives, certainly, in, the, in that, in that uh, scheme, you know, in that particular paradigm would be high income. So how do I maximize my average revenue per user and lifetime value? But through the process of experiencing everything that went into the four-hour work week and writing the four-hour work week, it, it, was, it was extremely clear to me that income is something that you trade for other things. So then the question is, what are you trading it for? You have objects, you have experiences. And I decided that I do like objects. I have plenty of objects, but <laughs> I wanted predominantly experiences, and that meant that I needed access to people and resources I would otherwise not have access to, or access to people and resources that very few people have access to. And I just decided that taking the traditional direct response, uh, direct response route with uh, all of the various productization that goes along with that, at that point in time, would have been harmful to that objective. Uh, and I had a very clear idea that was in 2007, the book came out April. I was moving into high tech. I wanted to become a, an extremely astute investor. And I knew that, for instance, the people I wanted to give me the time of day and ideally teach me uh, on a very intermittent part-time basis would be turned off by that. Mm. And so by putting my priorities in very strict order, I decided at that time that I didn't want to do it. And I didn't do it for the four-hour uh, body either. Uh, but uh, there have been opportunities to generate indirect and direct income from that. And one of the examples I would give is <laughs> the investing itself. So, the, I mean, the startup investing and advising that I do, uh, at least on paper, is worth, all the, uh, it, it is worth more than all of my royalties and advances combined right now. Oh, absolutely, it would be, for sure. Yeah, because, like, I've, you know, I remember in my first book, the government make more tax in Australia than the author does in royalties. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Since there's not a moneymaker by any, any stretch. Yeah, so it's uh, it's been a, it's been a really fascinating process, and I've been very lucky uh, and blessed to have many friends who try many different models. So yeah. I've been we've been able to swap stories, and and there's no one model that's right. It's a very personal decision. Yeah, I can completely agree, and that's that's the beautiful thing about it. People can can work and mold it, and the kind of I guess object versus experience kind of goal that you had for yourself does come through in the in the four hour work week when you talk about mini retirements. May not be as explicitly spoken about, but that's sort of obviously your um, modus operandi and that's sort of all about experience. So, so you kind of have lived that obviously in the way you promoted the book as well as just teach through the book itself. Yeah, I try to, you know, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's really important to walk your talk and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, we, we all have to constantly sharpen the saw and we all constantly have to course correct, but I really do, like, I really do follow everything that I talk about in my books. Like I, I do not BS it. Like uh, yep. I take it very seriously that uh, you know, I need to lead by example. And it also doesn't hurt that I live in San Francisco. So it's like if somebody sees me walking around with a gut hanging over my belt, there'd be a thousand photographs <laughs> on within the hour. So a very, very good positive constraint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so in terms of experiences and stuff, you kind of alluded to a, a very unique one that we were talking about um, before, and that was the Amazon publishing thing with the new book. You're, you're going down the path of um, publishing through Amazon's publishing house now. Um, do you want to sort of talk about that with the new 4-Hour Chef book and how that's sort of all transpiring and things? 
Absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, I had the opportunity. The reason that I jumped into a new book so quickly was simple. I mean, I had the opportunity to be the first major book out of Amazon publishing. And that is one hell of an opportunity Absolutely. because you look at Amazon, number one, it's a hundred billion dollar company. But quite aside from that, if you want to talk about direct response, I know people may not think of Amazon as a direct response company, but they are the most sophisticated direct response <laughs> call to action company on the planet. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's insane. They, you want to talk about split testing? Oh my God, they're amazing. So the what the the main driver? Well, there's several main drivers, but the the most interesting thing to me is that Amazon, if you think about it, is the only B to C, right, business to consumer publisher on the planet in many ways, on a large scale at least. Because if you're Random House or you're uh, Wiley pick, or yeah, Wiley or you name you know you name your publisher, uh, they are a business to business company. The director of sales of whatever division it might be sells to the head buyer of a category at Barnes and Noble. They call then the head buyer of a category at Books a Million, and so forth and so on. So they do not have the ability to communicate directly with their end users. Amazon can do that whenever they want. And not only that, but Amazon probably knows me based on my buying behavior. They probably know me better than I know myself. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and uh, that is just fascinating. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward and have enjoyed, I'm looking forward to continuing my experience with Amazon, and they've been really scrappy and really aggressive in, in all the right ways. So I've been very excited to work with them. But, uh, you know, if you're at the front line trying to do things that are different, uh, you're going to take a few arrows. So the price I'm paying is that the traditional retailers are boycotting the book. Many of them. Not There, there are some indies who are carrying it, but Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, they've all taken a very public stance against it. Now, I think that's kind of silly because it's inconvenient, inconveniencing their customers at the end of the day, but uh, only time will tell. But, uh, I mean, it's, you know, this is the, I've, I've been very happy with my experience so far. I mean, this is by easily the most beautiful book I've put together. It's impressive. Like, I've seen the digital version of it that the team sort of sent through to me, and I have to say it is by far visually the most engaging book you put together so far. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we, oh my Lord, did we spend a lot of time on this. I mean, it was like a 40-person startup working on this thing and pulled out all the stops. Uh, but uh, the verdict is out, you know. We'll see how things turn out. It's uh, it's inevitable that things are moving to digital. Uh, the print and digital version are uh, obviously available through Amazon and elsewhere. Uh, but in this particular case, I wanted to create, you know, not only something that was very, very effective as a teaching tool and a choose your own adventure for human potential, uh, from the learning standpoint, we can get into the book, uh, whenever you want, yeah, yeah. but, but, but the, I wanted to create a work of art, you know, something that people would be really like eager to put on their coffee table. And, uh, to that extent, you know, the way you read something digitally is different from the way you read a book. So for instance, what I noticed when I was going through the digital and going through the print is that I designed the print. I wrote the print book in terms of two-page spreads, like the left and right mm -hmm. working. And you just don't have that in digital. Nice. <laughs> you know, I didn't really think about it that way, but I was like, huh. Like if you have a whole page, like full page bleed photo on the left-hand side and then some accompanying text on the right-hand side, that's two separate pages in digital. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's really fun to, to play around with everything. Yeah. So what, what's the, the biggest surprise you have got um, from working with Amazon from a, an education standpoint that you didn't kind of expect? What's a really cool takeaway you've had working with them? A uh, really good takeaway. Uh, they, they like testing as much as I do. <laughs> Very they're, cool. If, if we don't have an answer, they're like, okay, great. Let's try, let's, let's try two versions, see what converts, you know? Awesome. And so that, that is just lovely for a person like me you know Absolutely. Very and, cool. I, yeah it would love, that, that's the sort of stuff i love too so that's very very cool yeah so i'd say that was very surprising to me but ultimately made a lot of sense because you look at a company of that size and it could be very very bureaucratic but amazon publishing itself is a startup so they need to be nimble they need to move fast so i've been very reassured by uh by how fast and aggressive and uh, analytical they've been thus far
Very cool, man. Very cool. So let's delve into the book. Do you want to give the setup and ex- explain the book? You know, it's, it's your new baby. It's what you're bringing out to the world. Do you want to sort of give it some context? Yeah, for sure. So the Four Hour Chef. Uh, the subtitle is important. So the Four Hour Chef: the Simple Path to Cooking Like a Pro, Learning Anything, and Living the Good Life. So very narrow scope. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the my readers have been asking me for a book on learning and accelerated learning, mastering skills for four or five years. I mean, it's just that has been the, the single most constant request because I tackle all these weird skills like learning languages and yeah. tango world championships and Japanese horseback archery, whatever. And the, I had always been searching for kind of the perfect context to create a book like that because writing about learning in the abstract is actually really boring. So it's like, how could I, I need stories to tell. I need experiments, like wild ass experiments. So I was looking for the right context. And, uh, <laughs> At the same time, what was happening to me was uh, I, I started getting this digital malaise. Like, I would do all this stuff in the interwebs and on computers, and I'd shut my laptop, and I just had this kind of angst about not making anything with my hands. I wanted to make physical stuff and uh, reclaim that humanness. I just I was very, yeah, I sort of had this existential problem with not making things. And I thought it was going to be woodworking. But at the end of the day, it was too inconvenient. I had to travel. I didn't want a crappy birdhouse in my living room. <laughs> and uh, so I, I saw my girlfriend cooking one night, and she learned to cook by watching her grandmother. And I, I just, like, the, the light went off. And I was like, I could learn to cook. You know, I could learn yeah. to cook. And then I thought, you know, this would be really interesting because cooking had kicked my ass many times in the past, and I'd quit so many times. So I thought, well, you know, for the first time, like, why don't I show my readers Tim Ferriss naked, not literally, but naked in the sense that I start from being really insecure and not knowing anything about something that's beaten me before, and then for, a, you know, let's say a year, trying to get as good as possible. And like, what do I actually do? So that's the book. But the trick is, <clears throat> it's kind of like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, because it's a cookbook for learning disguised as a cookbook for food, right? <clears throat> and so, like, absolutely, I can, I can teach you through very, I, I think, you know, minimalist, elegant, 80-20 methods to get really good at cooking really fast. That's in there. Like, I, I mean, I, as an experiment, for instance, I worked with some chefs to compress six months of culinary school into 48 hours so people can try to do that on the weekend if they want. Like, it's absolutely doable. But the real recipe of the book is the same recipe that I think people like Da Vinci used or like Benjamin Franklin or Nikolai Tesla or Jobs, which is this meta-learning, you know, the skill of learning skills, whether it's shooting three-pointer or basketball, whether it's learning Spanish in 8 to 12 weeks or uh, learning to cook or memorizing a deck of playing cards, whatever it is, like there is a, a process that you can go through. Um, that is extremely reliable, which is what I've applied to all these different skills in my life. And um, that is, uh, you know, in a nutshell, the, the four-hour work week, not the four-hour work week, excuse me, the four-hour <laughs> four chef, too many four hours out there. And what, it's, it's been really fun because when you think about the kitchen, you think about food, it, it engages all of your senses. There are very few things that do that. So in a way, the the kitchen is the ultimate dojo for human potential. Like you can train in the kitchen for everything outside of the kitchen. And uh, if someone gets this book and they never cook anything in it, that's okay because, I mean, I would like them to try it, but at the end of the day, even if you just learn more about food, your experience of eating three times a day will go from, you know, black and white to like HD in a million colors. And that's the experience that I had, which is just awesome. (laughs) Well, so, yeah. I'm, I'm two meals in. I, I'm not a cook. Like, I don't cook at all. I'm not a food person. If I can get my meal out of a, a power smoothie kind of thing, I'm, I'm that way. But I'm, I'm, I'm two meals in already, so my wife is loving it. Awesome. <laughs> so we moved into a new house, and she was actually threatening, saying, if we're going to move in, I want you to start cooking. You've you got to start learning how to cook because I just don't really enjoy food. It not, not, hasn't been my thing. And I was like, yeah. well, you know, this book hit my, hit my inbox at the same time as uh, moving house. So it's like, all right, here's an excuse to use the kitchen and, and make her happy. So it's, uh, it's been really cool. 
Cool. Yeah, wait until you get to uh, Sexy Time Steak. That's a good one. That makes my wife happy as well. Awesome. Well, she's six months pregnant, so it's obviously uh, yeah, interesting. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, the question I did have, though, is you, you touched on a, a word that you said, mastering any skill. Now, yep. like Robert Greene, uh, author of 48 Laws of Power and, and all those great yep. books, and I've been talking a lot recently about his own book, and we had him on the podcast a couple of weeks ago talking about Mastery, and that's obviously the topic of his new book. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with with his book, his book or anything like that. But he talks quite a bit about to master a skill, it takes a long time to do an apprenticeship, and you've got to go through this apprenticeship phase. And obviously, what you're talking about here is a little bit different. Um, and on the surface of it, off surface of it, sorry, it sounds like you're sort of juxtaposing your, in your in your thoughts. But you kind of do discuss mastery and, and how that applies a little bit at the start of your book. Can you sort of talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually have Robert's book. Um, you know, obviously Robert and I have some friends in yeah. common. <laughs> so I have his book uh, right next to me, literally within arm's reach, uh, <laughs> because I think it's a great book. And in many ways, it's like the perfect compliment. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that to the four hour chef, because he goes in depth into apprenticeships mm. and also goes in depth into how to choose which skills you want to learn. Uh, which like, the, the just melds perfectly with the 4-Hour Chef, which is kind of more like uh, sort of how-to nuts and bolts, like here's like step-by-step in every detail how to tackle skill acts, right? Now, uh, I don't think that Robert and I are actually uh, juxtaposed in many ways. I would say that the uh, where a lot of confusion comes up is is in defining world class or in defining mastery. Yeah, people have two different ways of defining it. Of course, they're going to seem to disagree. Uh, so I would say a few things. Uh, I do fundamentally disagree with the ten thousand hour rule. I think it's, I think it is a uh, uh, oftentimes confusing correlation with causation. So you could look at let's say the top violin players in the world, and you can say, oh, they're all Asian. Like you need to be Asian to, to master the violin. Um, and it's not quite that simplistic, and I get it, but there are many different reasons why someone who is predisposed to uh, becoming very skilled at a certain thing, who is uh, who is in an environment that fosters that, uh, and or who depends on that skill fundamentally for their professional career, would put in 10,000 hours no matter what, Yeah. right? So I don't think it it uh, it necessarily determines mastery or prevents mastery uh, if you're if you're less or above that. There's certainly pe- t- plenty of people who put in ten thousand hours in, into skills who never make it to world class. From my from my perspective, uh, and I think I mean Robert's book is awesome. I mean the case studies alone are just fantastic. But the research he puts in it's absolutely insane, and you can you can tell in, in Ryan Holiday's book as well that obviously he's been a. Uh, uh, a studious student of Robert's in terms of the amount of research and you as well putting into the book. It's insane. Oh yeah, yeah. He's no, he's great. So, w- what I would say is that uh, the way I define world class is top five percent in the entire population of the planet. Right now, if you want to be Tiger Woods, well, <laughs> you're Yo Yo Ma. I have good news and bad news. So the good news is you can get pretty close. Uh, I mean, you can become top 5% in uh, golf included, I think, within 6 to 12 months of not just deliberate practice, but very intelligent, deconstructed practice where you test contrarian approaches. Um, And I have a lot of thoughts on that, of course. But if you want to be Tiger Woods, the bad news is you would have known it when you were 6 or 7 years old uh, because he was drawing pictures of irons hitting golf balls at different distances and not pirate ships that age. So... The uh, I think there's a huge difference between becoming world class and dedicating your life to a single craft because just as in language learning, to get to the point where, for instance, uh, let's just say <clears throat> you know, 29 out of 30 days in the month, you seem like a perfect fluent speaker, might take 12 months. Um, to get to the point where 20 days out of a month, you know, living in a foreign country, you seem like a native speaker it might take eight to twelve weeks to get to the point where thirty days out of thirty you seem like a perfectly fluent speaker might take thirty years. Mm. So it's a diminishing point of returns also with many of these things. So you have to choose sort of what your target is, right? And uh, you know, for me, I, I 
what makes life exciting to me, and I think also to general, generalists like Steve Jobs, and the reason he was so effective at connecting dots that other people didn't see, is because he was world class at several things. Uh, and that's kind of fallen out of style, but uh, polymaths you know, ruled the day not all too long ago. And I think that there's a lot of power in, in being extremely good at but not a special, not necessarily a specialist in one thing. So being very good at many things and not necessarily a specialist in one thing. Uh, in my particular case, you know, I, I seem to dabble in a lot, and I do dabble in a lot. But that doesn't mean I'm me- that doesn't mean I'm mediocre, right? And it doesn't mean you have to be me- mediocre at all. Um, so tango is an example. I mean, uh, world record semifinalist in the world championships after five and a half months, and I took my training very seriously, six to eight hours a day. And it was extremely well structured and analytical, and I outlined the whole process that I went through for that in the book. Um, but to to get to the point where I win the world championships, let's say two years in a row, that's another twenty years, and I'm just not willing in that particular case to put in twenty years when I can get ninety nine percent of the way there in five and a half months. Yeah. Uh, but for instance, the the one thing that I am aiming to be the best at in the world is teaching metal learning. That's my skill. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But it's uh, I, I definitely have more in common by many magnitudes of order with with Robert. I think than we have any difference in opinion. Oh, I completely agree. Just from the outside, it kind of does look for a lot of people like, well, hang on, what, which way, which path do I follow? So I guess there was a couple of things you also said in the book that kind of talks about meta learning and how you sort of apply it. That I'd love to dissect with you if, if you don't mind me sort of trying to reread some stuff you wrote and kind of get your opinion to sort of pull it apart a bit more, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. You, you talk about failure points, and you, you say, I don't care why people pick up cookbooks. I'm much more interested in why they put them down. Yep. Now, I think it's, it's a very, very cool way of thinking, and it's obviously something that does set you apart from most people, the questions you ask yourself and the things you look for. Can you sort of explain that philosophy a little bit more and kind of what that actually means as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the enthusiasm to start something <clears throat> is important, but to me, what's most important is when people quit, because that determines how good they end up being. And I had quit cooking many times in the past, and uh, I also polled 500,000 or so Twitter and Facebook followers uh, to identify the failure points in cooking, because I wanted to spot patterns, and they're pretty clear, and you could guess most of them, where uh, where it's uh, time, obviously, so grocery shopping, too many ingredients, uh, cost of gear, cleanup of gear, uh, so forth and so on. There, there are very predictable failure points. And so my objective then became to eliminate those failure points uh, as much as possible throughout the entire process, but especially in the beginning when early wins are necessary to solidify a new habit. Right, and if you look at Nike Plus, for instance, they've identified that five sessions logged triggers people to then habitually use the service. If people quit before that, then they tend not to start again. So my objective became to l- limit all of the, f- the the first set of recipes in the book. They, well, they explain the structure a little bit. So there's metal. There are a number of sections in the book. There's meta learning, which covers all of this crazy accelerated learning stuff, from smart drugs to the tango to languages, everything. Then there's domestic, which takes all of the fundamental and most powerful skills of culinary school and compresses them in four, into four hours of total prep time. So that's 15 or so meals, average of nine minutes of prep time each, four ingredients or less, uh, cooking twice a week. Very low stress, really low stress. And so for this, coming back to the Nike Plus, five sessions, right? So for the first six meals, which is three weeks, I encourage people to use disposable plates. Why? No cleanup, (laughs) right? I encourage people to use a very, very, very minimal amount of gear. Why? Low cost, extremely little or zero uh, cleanup, again. And, uh, also, from the shopping perspective, it takes five minutes instead of a half hour. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so the, the way that I look at any skill is that someone's success can be predicted by three things. Uh, and I'll do these in ascending order of importance. So efficiency, doing things well, making good use of time. That's critical, but it's not the most important. 
Next up the ladder is effectiveness. So doing the right things, picking the doing the eighty twenty analysis and picking the twenty percent of activities techniques that deliver eighty percent or more of the value. Okay, that's second most important. The most important of all is adherence. Are you actually going to follow the program? Right? Because I could say the most effective way to lose fat is to tape bowling balls to your hands and do winds up and down a hill. And that might be true, but nobody is going to do it after two, like after one work. <laughs> so it doesn't make any difference. Adherence is number one. Uh, so when people say to me, well, what's the best language learning approach? I'm like, I could give you my best learning language approach. But if something's half as effective and you actually enjoy it and you're going to use it, that's what you should use. Hmm. The best method is the one that you use. Uh, so th those are, those are uh, a few of the ways that I think about skills and skill acquisition. Adherence is number one. Yeah. That's something you don't hear a lot of people talk about. So I think it's really, really cool sort of insight there. But the, the other thing you could talk about in the same sort of um, conversation as these sort of failure points is this margin of error thing. And you kind of talk about that, you know, in real estate, it's, you make a profit when you buy the property and not when you sell it. And in cooking, it, it could be that, you know, what is it? A good meal um, is by picking recipes well, not following the recipes well. So it's about picking the right recipes, not following them well. So yep. from that perspective, like how does people, I think this is a problem people have, is that like, well, who do I believe? Who do I trust? Do I go and, you know, buy that New York, York Times test best-selling book that came out last week that was paid, on, paid to get on the list by the, the CEO of the company using the analogy you gave earlier. Like, how do you find yeah. the good information to follow? Ooh, well, uh, I have my own approach. I'll, I'll tell you how I do it on Amazon um, because I read you know, tens of thousands of pages for this book, and I, but there are literally you know, millions of pages of cookbooks out there. So how do you even begin to whittle that down? Uh, the way that I did that was uh, I polled people, and that could just as easily be done with ten people who like cookbooks. It doesn't need you don't need you know, one point two million blog readers or whatever. Like you, you, you can do this as an individual quite easily, or look for top ten lists on websites, top ten cookbooks of the year, top ten cookbooks of the decade. It's really easy to do the recon on that. Then I went to Amazon and identified books that were. Uh, at least five years old or ten years old. The reason I did that is because the reviews are less likely to have been gamed. And then I looked at uh, only books that had at least a four-star average. Uh, then I looked at their most helpful voted uh, three- and four-star reviews because both the one-star and the five-star tend to not have all too much information in them. Uh, to decide which books to purchase. Then I purchased, let's say, of the 100 that I look at that week, I purchased all 20 on the Kindle. And this is, there's a reason for that. I purchased all 20 on the Kindle, and then I would look at their most highlighted passages for each book, which only takes about 10 minutes each. And that would help me decide which books to actually dig into. That would give me a very good taste. I mean, if I didn't like the highlights, it's kind of like not liking the preview for a movie. Yeah. Like, like, if you didn't like the preview for the movie, you're definitely not going to like the movie. <laughs> you know? uh, and then I would dig in. So that's how I would take, let's say, 100 potential books that have been, that have been recommended as good and narrow it down to five to seven. Very, very uh, cool. Yeah, that's how I go about it. I love it. Very cool. One other thing I kind of, that I highlighted uh, in, the, in the book as I was reading it was this distinction that you make between cook and chef. And you say, if I get this right, my memory is correct, is that you say that someone who can cook is a cook, but someone who creates the menu and runs the kitchen is a chef. Yeah. So do you think, and how would you apply this distinction to business? Do you think that there's too many people out there who are calling themselves marketers and business owners when all they're really doing is like kind of like the mechanical, technical stuff of, of the business and not actually worrying about the actual marketing and the, actually the growing of the business? They're too sort of distracted by the mechanics? Oh, yeah, for sure. And that's actually a really smart analogy. Um, so, yeah, the point I make in the, in the introduction of the book is that you know, becoming, a, becoming a chef is about uh, becoming self-reliant and self-directed because chef is from, like, jefe, it's from head in Latin, and it means boss. So it's not just about becoming 
uh, self-reliant in the kitchen. It's about becoming sort of the director in your own life and not a spectator. And uh, like you said, in the cooking world, a cook is someone who can sort of execute their task well, can produce food well, and a chef is someone who's more like an uh, more like a conductor. He can do all the line line uh, you know the line order stuff, but he can do a lot more than that. He or she. So in business, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as you know, Michael Gerber of the E Myth Revisited would say. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who spend time in their business and not on their business. And those people uh, rightfully are called technicians, you know, yep. and they may be very good at using the tool du jour, or they may be very good at, let's say, marketing uh, or sales or biz dev, but be terrible at accounting or whatever it might be. And they are absolutely, I mean, they're cooks in their business as opposed to the chef. They're, they're a cook in their business as opposed to a chef of their business, yeah. although it's odd to put it that way. But, yeah, the, the analogy is absolutely accurate. I think that's – yeah, absolutely. That, that was one really really cool distinction that, that I love. It's something that I believe and we talk about quite a bit on the show here, which is really cool. So in terms of the book, obviously it's out this week, which is very exciting. Um, obviously available on Amazon <laughs> because uh, that's a publisher. Um, <laughs> you would hope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, with the Amazon thing, now there's obviously discrepancies of people sort of talking about, you know, Amazon sales. Do they? Don't they apply to the New York Times bestseller list? And I'm sure that's obviously not a core objective for you with this book. But do you feel it's going to actually affect that at all? Oh, it absolutely could. And I mean, it, it's still a target of mine. But the the New York Times list is a uh, it's it's a it's a black box, uh, and they don't indicate which outlets uh, they accept reporting from. So there are some indications, of course, like Barnes & Noble does report, Amazon does report, but for the New York Times, it's very important to have a variety of reporting sources, whereas for, let's say, the Wall Street Journalist, the Wall Street Journalist is actually a, a, a better reflection of true bestsellers because their data is pulled directly from book scan numbers, which are point of sale and incorporate almost all of the uh, different reporting sources, not just a select handful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really, I would love to hit the New York Times, number one. I mean, of course, I'm very competitive, and I, you know, <laughs> bled out my eyeballs to make this book something that can stand the test of time for many years. So, like, I want to see it win the battle, uh, of course. Uh, I actually do have... Uh, a, a special offer, if, uh, if, if, if you'd be open to me sharing it. I was about, it with, I was about to ask you what sort of cool promotional stuff you got planned. So, yeah, you've, you saved me a question. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a bunch of really fun stuff coming. Uh, people should definitely check out, of course, the, uh, the movie trailer for the book and everything else on 4hourchef.com. But what I'd like to offer to people, because I really, like, I have never been more confident in a book, really, ever. Like, this, this thing, is, it's solid. I'm really happy with it. Could not be prouder. And uh, if people buy three print copies of the book, uh, it's the holidays, right? It's get one for yourself and two for other people. If you get three print copies of the book, send the Amazon email receipt or wherever you buy it, but three print copies to three books, so the number three books at fourhourchef.com, number four, then hourchef.com. And I will invite you to a, an exclusive live Q&A with me for one to two hours uh, after launch week. And you can ask me whatever you want. So that's just something fun that I, I, I thought some people might be interested in. If you buy three books, send the, uh, send the email receipt for the print books to three books at fourhourchef.com. And uh, you will get an invite. And then we can have some wine and jam out. Beautiful. Good, good direct response call to action. <laughs> I do what I can. I do what I can. <laughs> One final question, man. I'll, I'll let you go because I know you, you're busy with the launch and things like that. And this is a, a question I ask most people we have on the show is, what's the one question I didn't ask you that I should have? Ooh. Mm, that's it. That, that alone is a good question. Uh, <laughs> let's see. The question that you didn't ask... Is, is there something that you, because you've done plenty of PR and stuff like this, and I, you're going to have plenty of PR with the book, particularly with the whole traditional media or traditional outlets not supporting it, but is there any sort of questions you've never been asked that you think someone probably should have at some point with all the topics of the different books you've written about? Uh, you know, it's a good question, I think, that doesn't get asked enough, which is, you know, if you could ask people today, if you, if you hope readers take one action after reading this book, what would it be? Cool. You know, something, 
like that. So the, in the case of the four-hour chef, I'll answer that. The, what I want people to do is to be not only, not only confident enough, but excited to take something that they've given up on. Like in my case, I assumed I would never be able to swim, and I learned to swim about two years ago. I assumed I would never be able to, to play basketball because I'd been like humiliated by a junior varsity coach <laughs> in like junior high. And I finally you know, learned how to shoot like three-pointers and actually have, like, find it super relaxing. So I want people to not only have the confidence, but to be excited to take a skill that they've given up on. Something long ago they wanted to try and just accepted they would never be good at. And to like really go after it, uh, just to just to give it a shot, you know, try to tackle something that they've given up on. Um, that's what I want people to do. Very very cool, man. So let me ask you this question: Did you ever do the the marathon that you sort of ta- was it marathon you spoke about in the four hour body that you were were trying to do at some stage? Is that still on yeah, your list? Yeah, yeah, the uh, yeah the ultra marathon. I actually did not end up doing that um because well for a few reasons but principally because i ended up making so much so much progress with the deadlift that was another one of my goals that i wanted to go past 500 pounds and uh got to the point where i was actually doing uh, no no reps or anything just chalk at a body weight of about 165 uh, from the knees doing uh, i did five repetitions with uh 650 nice so and that was from a pre-weight of uh, maximum of about 315 pounds for one repetition. So, um, and I think that's actually a good illustration. And that is, you know, number one, you can you can always be flexible uh, in in picking your targets. But also, you know, if you have a major major weakness, uh, you don't have to like in business, right? You don't always have to focus on fixing your weaknesses. You can focus on magnifying your strengths. Mm. And uh, part of the benefit of trying several different skills, right? Let's say attempting to become world class, you know, top five percent in one or two skills a year, is that you very quickly see what you progress you progress fastest at, and then you can focus on that. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a very gratifying, a very gratifying, and uh, fun way to live, I think. So I'm, I'm hoping to expose more people to that. Love it, man. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, that call to action again is check out the, uh, the links on the show notes, buy three copies of the book, give it to your family, and uh, shoot that email across to get the, the two hours with Tim because it's uh, definitely well worth it. So, cool, uh, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via PrinterCast at printergroup.com. <laughs>